thank you very much for this uh, kind welcome. I'm increasingly presented as a veteran, which has advantages and disadvantages. From my point of view, the disadvantages slightly outweigh the advantages, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it's correct. Um, I've been invited to speak about the uh, pushing the boundaries for democracy. Um, and of course, when I'm speaking about this, I'm doing this from a very special position, which is more from a manager managerial standpoint. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, I'm a full communist, uh, but uh, I have an important management role in an institution which is a cornerstone of European, um, European democracy. And what I will try to do is a kind of mapping exercise. So what are the issues that are raised and where? Um, so to give a kind of overview, uh, what are the challenges uh, in the different parts of the system? In order to be able to do this, I think we need to first clarify uh, in which kind of system we are working or what kind of system the European Union is. Because if you get the basic assumption wrong, all the consequences will also be wrong. And uh, I'm not saying this, um, let's say, with our background, because there's a natural tendency in the European Union to, of course, assume that the European Union somehow has to function like our national systems. If you make that over assumption, you already have a guarantee that you are going to the wrong conclusions. Why is this the case? This is the case because our national systems are what political scientists describe as fusion of power systems. So fusion of power systems means you have a permanent parliamentary majority on every issue, that corresponds to a permanent governing majority, and these two are very closely aligned. This is not the case for the European Union. We are a division of power system, we are a balance of power system, we are a checks and balances system, where the parliamentary majority is not aligned to a parliament to a majority in the executive, but on the contrary, there's permanent negotiation on everything. So when the Commission makes a proposal, the answer from Parliament can be no, yes, or amending 99% of the cases that is amended. Which means that Parliament, Council and the Commission are in permanent negotiations with completely open outcomes. That you don't find in any of our national systems, but you can find something similar in the United States, which is also a system of balance of power, checks and balances, and permanent negotiation between the House, the Senate, and the administration, like we do between the Parliament, the Council, and the Commission. So, the first important message is that any kind of parallelism with what we know from our national systems has to be pushed to the side. Why are we in such a system? We are in such a system because the European Union has to be based on pluralism. Like the founding fathers in the United States, we have to come to the conclusion that we are based on pluralism because we are not one people. We are 28 states, if we were to say that we are 28 people, that would be enough, because we are more than 28 people. How many? That's a very contentious uh, political issue normally. Uh, but at least in Britain alone, we have four. We have the English nation, we have the Welsh, we have the Scottish, and we have the Northern Irish, which is extremely positive, because like this, they are not always winning in football championships, <laughs> because they're dividing up in four national teams. We are not having the same conclusion as in the Champions League. The others have a chance to <laughs> So that already brings us to 31, plus some others that I don't want to go into detail. So 
We are based on many nations, therefore we have to be based on pluralism. And therefore, everybody has to be listened to. And because everybody has to be listened to, we have a system of permanent negotiations between the Parliament, the Council, and the Commission with no forward conclusion on outcome. We are not a state, we are not a federal state, but we are a federal union. means we have division of competences on the federal level between the Parliament, the Council, and the Commission, but we also have division of competences vertically between the Union, the nation states, but also the regions. So power is distributed both on the horizontal level and on the vertical level. And therefore, and that leads me to the theme today, the democratic, cis, the democratic quality of the system is not just defined or established on the federal level of the system, but it has to be defined through all levels of the system, which means not only on the federal level of the system, but at least, depending on the constitutional setup in the member states, also on the national level. And it's also not just defined by the European Parliament, it's also defined by the Council of Ministers, who works effectively as the other chamber in a two-chamber system in the European Union. So when we want to look at pushing the boundaries for democracies, when we try to establish a map of opportunities, unused opportunities, and maybe also progress, we have to look at the national level, in relationship to that European Federation, but we also have to look at the federal level, not only Parliament, but also at Council. <coughs> so if I should start on the national level, national parliaments play in our constitutional setup a key role, not only by endorsing treaty change, also checking subsidiarity, and most important, and that's the systematic role of national parliaments in the European Union, is they have to check on their own government as legislator in the council. So governments, national governments, are legislating in the council of ministers, but of course they should be controlled by their own national parliaments. Here we're having two issues or two problems. First, if you are in a fusion of power system where the parliamentary majority is the same as the government majority, those checks on the government might be a little bit uh, limited because basically you're checking on yourself. You're checking on the same party, you're checking on the same political majority. And that's why we find out that those checks are more vigorous in systems where we have coalition government, and they are even more vigorous in systems where there is no permanent parliamentary majority and no permanent government majority, and the outstanding example of this is Denmark. Denmark is now being governed for several decades by minority governments, which means that the parliament is executing its right of scrutiny on the government as legislator in council to a very different degree than is the case in other systems. The second problem we are having for national parliaments is that in fact their status in their own participation on European policy control is extremely different. Give you a practical example. When you go to a meeting of presidents of national parliaments with the president of the European Parliament, the first intervention is normally the intervention of the Speaker of the House of Commons, who is saying that he would like to clarify that based on the constitutional nature of his office, he's not allowed to speak about politics. <laughs> It's a bit difficult because the question is, if you're not allowed to speak about politics, you want to speak about administration, maybe. Surely not. Of course, afterwards, he's speaking about politics. But the first thing he has to do is to clarify that his office doesn't allow him to have any political role. That makes cooperation on parliaments not very easy. There are parliaments who have the right to speak about their prime ministers, 
before they go to the European Council and afterwards, and the other parliaments who have no rights in this respect. There are parliaments who give a very clear mandate to their own government before they can take a position in Council of Ministers. <coughs> other parliaments who either don't bother or who are not bothered. Which means we have a very, very different degree of <coughs> de facto participation of national parliaments in their scrutiny role towards national governments. And it means if we want to think of European of national parliaments as an entity, there's a lot of work to be done to get them to a more similar level. To make a practical proposal, if we want national parliaments not just as individual parliaments to have an impact, but also to be able to, to work together as entities, then we should reflect on what I would call a gold standard for the controlled rights of national parliaments towards their own executives. So what should be rights that are there for everybody? From my point of view, definitely to hear the Prime Minister before they're going to the European Council. Definitely to get a report back from the Prime Minister once they're coming back from the European Council. And why not to have an exchange with their ministers before they take a position uh, in the Council of Ministers. So my practical recommendation would be to do some work on a gold standard for the participation of national parliaments in the control of their own executives. When we come to the Council of Ministers, the role of the Council of Ministers has been clarified with the Lisbon Treaty. Because it's now very clear that the Council of Ministers is the other chamber given that the European Council has been separated out as a separate institution uh, and therefore um, is uh, separated from the Council of Ministers. So they are the other chamber. They are, what I would say, the first chamber. And that's created a special situation because it means we are having the European Union in one chamber executives that legislate. It's not that that doesn't exist elsewhere. It exists, for example, in Germany. We have a Bundesrat where executives legislate. But it's nevertheless rather a minority situation. Normally we're having senates which are composed of senators. So that executives legislate is relatively rare happening in the Bundestag and we are having that situation in the European Union. So we are having a Senate for the Council of Ministers who is legislating through executives. That's raising a number of questions. If you have the other chamber as an executive, as an assembly of executives who legislate, and the question could be raised, what kind of democratic standards do we want to foresee for such an assembly? We could compare to other first chambers, to other senates, and say, going through that comparison, are democratic standards, as we expect them, fulfilled, or are they not fulfilled? One thing that we see immediately is the absence in the Council of Ministers of a plenary function. When we are thinking of the Bundesrat, finally the Bundesrat comes together in plenary. It could be either the Prime Ministers or it could be the Europe Ministers. And they are coming together in plenary and they are passing legislation. Coming together in plenary means it's a very open, transparent public act, not just by providing written text, but by deliberating in public and therefore taking responsibilities for the decisions in public. We are not having that plenary function in the European Union, in the other chamber that's called the Council, that's called the Council of Ministers. But the plenary has also another function. A plenary is balancing out 
between sectorial interests. So if I take the plenary of the European Parliament, <coughs> when we have legislation, we might have one view from the Agricultural Committee, but we might have a different view on the same issue from the Environment Committee. And we again might have a different view, for example, from the Industry Committee or the Internal Market Committee. Which means all these different views have a place where they are balanced out, and that's happening through amendments in the plenary of the European Parliament. In the Council of Ministers, as the other chamber of the European Union missing that plenary function, <coughs> you get one to one the outcome of the Agricultural Council without the input of the Environment Ministers, without the input of the Industry Ministers, and therefore this balancing out is not happening because we are lacking that plenary function on the Council of Ministers side. So I would believe, because this is also an initiative of universities and of the Catholic University of Leuven, uh, that some uh, academic research program would be very useful to study what quality requirements we should have for the Council of Ministers that has effectively become the other chamber in a two-chamber system inside the European <coughs> Union. And it's very astonishing for me that so little attention also in the academic world has been spent on the functioning of the Council. The European Council is uh, a new institution. It was established only formally as a European institution in 2009. It's expected to give guidance to the European Union. If we try to understand it in more traditional terms, we could say the European Council is something like if we were a state, which we are not our collective head of state or collective head of union, not like the German president, uh, who is more in speeches, uh, more ambitious than that, but also not like the French, uh, who is more operational, somewhere in between. But in a constitutional reflection, that's about the place where this institution is sitting. It is, at least it was in the last 10 years, very much occupied with crisis management. And I think it played a very important role uh, which I call the elevator function. Elevator function means that there are issues which are competence of the European Union, but still it needs the active involvement of the European Council to de facto move them up to European Union decision making. So we can understand treaty changes as the moment of potential sovereignty transfer, but whether sovereignty finally is transferred is dependent on legislation. And in some more sensitive areas, it needs the active involvement of the uh, heads of state and government, as we have seen through several crises over the last years. Um, the issues that have been arising from a democratic standpoint is that over the last 10 years, there were moments <coughs> where the European Council felt that it had to take over a kind of quasi-legislative role. Uh, currently to be observed on all issues uh, to do with migration, where the European Council has concluded that it wants to deal with those issues on the basis of anonymity, which is not what is laid down in the treaties. In the treaties these are legislative issues to be decided mostly with qualified majority. So the fact that the European Council has taken these issues over uh, many times with very limited success has meant that effectively issues which were already under qualified majority voting were discussed or moved back on the side of the member states to anonymity because of their perceived sensitivity. We have similar issues when we are discussing the multi-annual financial framework. The European Council has the habit to put legislative issues into kind of 
brackets and reserve them for their own decision, which means that effectively the co-decision on those issues is very much hampered. And we've also seen, we've also seen the European Council in moments of crisis to resolve the intergovernmental treaties. So the questions that are raised here in this respect is, uh, are these transitional phenomena? Can we expect a transfer to the community system, as was, for example, already foreseen in the fiscal compact where a fighter's headline was, was established? Or is this not going to happen and we are going to enter into a kind of hybrid uh, situation, even on issues which concern legislation? The next is the European Parliament itself. Um, we, um, our own functioning uh, could be described with the uh, anarchist motto, we have no chance but we use it, <laughs> uh, because that's where we are coming from. So coming from the 50s and uh, even the governments uh, were not ready to call us the European Parliament, they wanted to call us assembly. To certain, as of a certain moment that the Parliament started to call itself the European Parliament and at a certain moment that was fully If we try to, to summarize the development uh, of our own rights, we could say, uh, we could distinguish between a kind of quantitative democratization, the expression I use for it, which means more and more issues were somehow submitted to Parliament, normally for advice. That's what I call quantitative democratization. And then a second phase, or second stream of decisions, which can be called qualitative democratization, which means we were moving up from giving an opinion to deciding, co-deciding, deciding. So in fact, over the decades, we have seen two trends, and with every treaty, it's further strengthened, of course, quantitative and qualitative democratization. And the outcome, with the final treaty which we are living on today, which is the Lisbon Treaty, is that in more or less all policy fields, with very few exceptions, we are equal lawmakers, we have the last words on trade, we elect the Commission President. Uh, so it's not the end of the story, but it can be regarded as, uh, you know, uh, nevertheless, a very satisfactory uh, outcome. Uh, how was this possible? The final step was the Lisbon Treaty. And the big move in the Lisbon Treaty were only possible because of the change of method. And remember, the last treaty before was the Nice Treaty. The Nice Treaty was done following the traditional method of treaty change, which is to put together civil servants from the member states first, and then prime ministers, and to ask them which competences would you like to give additionally to the European Union and the European Parliament. And the resounding answer in Nice was nothing. <laughs> With one exception, there was a legal base created for European political parties, but that came from us. So, under that method, asking national administrations what would they like to give us additionally, the answer was nothing. So, the key thing was to change the method. I remember. Uh, at the time of the Nice Treaty, I was Secretary General of the Parliamentary Group, and I had to advise my group leader at the time how to react to the Nice Treaty. And my advice was him, to him was, we need to have a change of method, and we should go for the convention method, which had been very successful indeed. And that's what European political parties did. There was first a resolution in the EPP Congress, then a resolution in the uh, Socialist Party Congress, and the method was changed to convention. And because of that change of method, additional space for further integration and democratization was given. So in many debates <coughs> or reflections about democracy, you maybe find a focus or even a limitation on the constitutional aspects of those issues. And if we were just concentrating on the constitutional aspects of those issues, then probably I would now need to finish my intervention. Because we didn't have another treaty. 
But the thing is that also without treaty change, the constitutional reality of the Union can be changed. And I would like to take you through a number of issues how and where I believe we have changed the constitutional nature of the Union without treaty change. The first is European political parties and foundations. Any functioning democracy needs functioning and well-established political parties. Political parties, of course, have different roles dependent on the system they are working in. The traditional literature on European political parties normally starts with uh, Duverger, 1957, who has established what are the functions of national parties. Then you have a comparison whether these functions are fulfilled by European political parties. Then you find out that these functions are not fulfilled by European political parties. And then you have the enlightened conclusion that therefore, obviously, European political parties are not of great value. I would like to defend the opposite position. My view is that in a system which is based on subsidiarity, European political parties should not fulfill the roles that are already fulfilled by national political parties. I believe that the European political parties <coughs> should fulfill exactly the roles that are not fulfilled by national political parties or that cannot be fulfilled by national political parties. Which means they should exactly be the mirror image of what national political parties are doing. So given that this is an initiative of universities, uh, I would strongly plead to uh, work on research programs which have a look at those mirror image functions. So what cannot be fulfilled by national political parties in the system of the European Union? What cannot be fulfilled by national political parties in uh, the European Union is exactly the balancing out of positions between actors in different European institutions. So the horizontal divide of government in the European Union, which means the actors of the same party in council, the actors of the same party in the commission, the actors of the same party in the European Parliament. Bring them together and try to coordinate views. That's the function European political parties are having, and several of them are also fulfilling. On the highest political level, with the involvement of heads of state and government, on ministerial level, on members of parliament level, and also involving national representatives. They have the responsibility to provide a common set of ideas, because national parties come with very different traditions and experience, and that needs to be brought together. And sometimes you even need to work on wording, because that wording has a different meaning in different national contexts. So they need to provide this. They need to provide access to key decision makers, which otherwise is not provided. And where it's not very convenient to just go through foreign ministries, that's rather, I would say, the approach of the 19th century. Today, the telephone has been invented. And not only the telephone, email, WhatsApp, and others. So contacts can be much more direct. And they can be direct if trust is established. They provide, they provide a trademark, a kind of quality guarantee by accepting other still yet unknown national parties into the system. So there are a whole lot of functions which are valuable functions of European political parties, but you don't see them if you base yourself on Duverger in 1957. So what have we been doing? We've been changing the regulatory framework of European political parties regularly, uh, two or three times in the last five years. And we've started to 
finance European political parties from the budget of the European Parliament, with this year 50 million for European political parties and 18 million for European foundations. What has this done? This has had as a consequence that the whole political space nowadays is organized in European political parties. Some might think that this is a bad idea. I rather believe it's a good idea because everybody needs to have a voice. And I can tell you, for example, when we started this more in earnest 10 years ago, I had a comment from somebody, a leading representative from the European left, who said, but this is impossible. We have this very heavy experience with the third international. I'm not an expert of the history of the Third International, but it must have been traumatic in that part of the political space. So the fact that European political parties were recognized and that funding was provided helped them to overcome the traumatic experience of the Third International, and they are now organized. And the same on the other extreme of the political spectrum, which means political views, political families have been had to organize, and as you could see yesterday evening in our televised debate, I think they've all very faithfully shown where they are coming from, and people could understand that Europe is in fact structured by political views, by political families, rather by, than by uh, national, um, rather than by, uh, by the nationality people are coming. We have activated unused treaty potential. So as, as an economist, uh, former economist rather, the former economist, I'm trained to see unused opportunities. If I were a lawyer, I would probably be trained to see restrictions and regulations. <laughs> I don't know how many I'm inciting in the room now, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it's high trend and potential. But as an economist, you should be trained to see unused opportunities. So when I read treaty, the Lisbon Treaty, I am not looking for restrictions to what we can do, but I try to identify what are unused opportunities under the treaty. And given that treaties are only potential sovereignty transfer, because the real sovereignty transfer is only happening once we decide or once we legislate, then the territory is occupied. It is very useful to look out for unused opportunities. So, Spitzenkandidaten has been one field of trying to explore unused opportunities. Uh, with Spitzenkandidaten, we Germans are extremely proud because our impact on international language until recently was very limited. <laughs> <laughs> our biggest success in the English language was kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't want to stop there, you know. <laughs> so uh, now we are doing Spitzenkandidaten. And why do I say unused? unused potential under the treaty because the Lisbon Treaty changed the procedure on how we are electing the President of the European Commission and the text was changed three times. A. It said that the European Council has to consult the European Parliament before it makes a proposal. Secondly, it said that the European Council, before making into a proposal, has to take into account the outcome of the European election, which was finding that proposal that led to the outcome of the European election. And thirdly, it says the European Parliament elects the Commission President, which is a different language to the one we had before and much stronger. So the council side concluded from this that given that the text was changed in three different aspects, logically everything should remain the same. <laughs> because council is an organization which is based on precedent and past practice. 
So if something is happening once, it's an accident. If it's happening twice, it's the rule that has to be implemented in all the future. <laughs> so three changes. What would, should be the practical consequences? Maybe nothing. And maybe fixing something. So treaty texts are opening up opportunities that can either be taken on board and exploited fully or wasted. So that's what I mean with it. have to make use of the unused treaty potential. De facto, we have acquired the right to refuse individual candidates for commissioners. It's not explicit in the treaty. You don't find in the treaty that Parliament can refuse individual commissioners. But we have seen through the last nominations that when candidates showed obvious weaknesses in the nomination procedure, Parliament expressed a view against, then the Commission President didn't accept those candidates and the members made the concern to post them. That's a change of a constitutional nature without treaty change. Also, programming. The general view is that the treaties are saying that the European Commission has the monopoly right of legislative initiative. That's not backed by the treaty. Because in the treaty you will find that the European Commission initiates the annual and multi-annual programming of the Union with a view to reach inter-institutional agreement. So that means we have a treaty base which is inviting the three institutions to come together on a legislative program. So that's what we have been doing over the last two, three years. So Parliament shares into the agenda setting function of the Union. Even more than is expressed by this article because look back to the last confirmation procedure of the Commission President, Jean-Claude Juncker. Jean-Claude Juncker was the candidate of the EPP. He had a five-point Juncker program backed by the EPP. And Jean-Claude Juncker, President-elect of the Commission, had a ten-point program. Not sure, because why should other political families support that candidate? if he's not also offering content that's close to their own conviction. So we got an investment program, we got much stronger on climate change. So in fact, Parliament has effectively used its capacity to elect the Commission President to have a major impact on agenda setting. And I believe that Parliament's administration has done major preparatory work for this through our work on the cost of non euro Third area, we can empower our members through expertise. Why is this important? This is important because we are in a system of division of power and not of fusion of power. If you are in a system of fusion of power, like in our national systems, you can rely on what your ministries are proposing to you. Because it's your ministries. It's the same political family. They're headed by your minister of the same political family. If you're living in a division of power system, like the European Union or the United States, you cannot just rely on what the executive is putting on your table. You have to develop your own critical view. And that's where the United States Congress has a lot to teach us. And I've sometimes been also publicly criticized for going native there. But my general approach is what is good we are taking over and all the bad things we are leaving over there. <laughs> uh, and I'm also not fascinated by Congress itself. But Congress has been very clever in one thing, which is it has created itself advisory institutions, content sources, all around Congress, which are not Congress, but which are maybe agencies of Congress, or even more independent. 
but they have permanent access to independent quality analysis and advice, which allows Congress to challenge the view of the administration. So, for example, the Congressional Research Service, the Library of Congress, the Government Accountability Office, the Congressional Budget Office. These are all independent, high-quality sources of content advice for lawmakers, which allows them to challenge the other house, but also the administration. What we have tried to do is to provide members with better quality advice in order to be able to challenge the European Commission proposal, but also to challenge the viewing council, which can base itself on all the expertise from 28 ministries. So five years ago, we established the European Parliamentary Research Service, which I think is now the biggest European think tank in town, as far as I can see. Don't know whether you follow it regularly, but I think we can say that really the contributions are very high quality. And even some national parliaments are taking this over for the information of their own members, uh, because why not? If this is objective and qualitative high ranking, this is very good. We have developed impact assessment and freed it from the imbalances that were there in the original concept coming from Britain. Impact assessment somehow has a little bit suffered as an idea because we know that Britain is doing impact assessments on everything unless when it matters. <laughs> So there was no impact assessment on Brexit. <laughs> and if there had been an impact assessment on Brexit, um, I don't know whether uh, the government would have followed that. But that has taken a little bit of legitimacy out of that project. But anyhow, we have tried to develop it in a more acceptable way, because we are not just checking impact of proposals, we are also checking the impact of not regulating an area. Otherwise, you get a bias against regulation. And checking the impact of not regulating, we call it the cost of non-Europe. And we believe there's still two trillion cost of non-Europe because we are under-regulated in many areas, especially digital. Uh, we have been on parliamentary initiatives together with all the other institutions setting up the ESPAS process, which is working on long-term trends. Uh, we have been, I think, instrumental in convincing the Court of Auditors to change its working model from error rate to performance audits, because error rates don't tell you anything, because you can implement a program with a very low error rate, and still the effect of that program is zero or negative. What is important is the performance, that's what the Government Accountability Office is doing in the United States for more than 50 years, and that's the new method of the Court of Auditors under its president, Klaus Heiner Lehne, who was before the chair of the Conference of Committee Chairs of the European Parliament. I'm mentioning this because democratic rights also have a reality. If it's not backed up by expertise, you will be losing out. If you can establish a parliament of the African Union, but if you don't give its members a telephone and functioning IT equipment, their parliamentary impact will be extremely limited. Fourth, if we want to dynamically develop the union, which is based on pluralism, if we know we need more solidarity in the future, then we also need to build up identity. Without more feeling of common identity, solidarity will be difficult. Uh, the European Union does a great job in Erasmus. So everybody who is participating understands that he is also a European and not just a national. And Parliament is always the institution who is re-establishing the figures which have been cut before by the member states when we come to the international relations. Uh, but we, can also, we have also been doing a lot of things on the administrative level. 
We've created a parliamentarium which is visited by 300,000 Europeans every year. We have created the House of European History, which is very strange for a parliament to run a museum. Uh, but we've created the House of European History where for the first time history is reconstructed not only as national history or regional history or local history or family history, but we analyze what do we share in common as Europeans and surprisingly even many issues were similar between East and West and uh, we will have about 250,000 visitors this year in the House of European History. We have been taking over the House of the Painter Wirtz, where we try to make a kind of uh, meeting forum, potentially under the aspect of art, because that's where what is the history. We are negotiating on the Bibliothek Solvay, where we would like to create the, the uh, in the Librairie de l'Europe, a library for Europe, with 10,000 books which bring together all the history uh, uh, of thought in the member states in 100 different uh, areas. Uh, we have contributed to the enlargement of the regional museum in Alsace in Chirnex to a European part, and we have been renovating the Jean Monnet House, which we are owning, and trying to make an international conference center out of this in Basel. So these are all individual initiatives, but all together they give a chance to relate to European integration, not just from a political, legislative, or administrative point of view, but also from an historical, cultural, and uh, sort uh, of ideas point of view. We've changed our own working methods. We have, under the heading of uh, completing the legislative cycle. So that's another way parliaments can enlarge their own constitutional role because the expectation is that we are amending legislation and that's it. But the legislative cycle is much longer. It starts with agenda setting, it goes through consultation, then you are amending legislation and then you scrutinize. We have changed our working method over the last five years to be active, relevant, and a player in all four phases, from agenda setting to consultation to amendment and to scrutinizing. That's what I call democratization in time. So you remember quantitative democratization, qualitative democratization, democratization in time, and given that I'm a German and um, therefore I have to be related to Einstein, we can't have democratization in time without democratization in space. <laughs> so quantitative democratization, qualitative democratization, democratization in time and democratization in space. Why do I propose, or why do I propose, and why do we implement these concepts? I propose these concepts and implement these concepts because they are widening the possibilities of lawmakers to impact on political decision making without treaty change. So, what does, does it mean, democratization in space? Democratization in space means we are a federal union. We are not a federal state, but given that we are a federal union, the union does not just consist of the Brussels institutions. There's the Parliament, the Council, the European Council, the Commission, but that's not the whole union. The whole union is also the member states, is also the regions, is also the citizens. And therefore the success and even the survival of that federal union will depend on that those levels of government are effectively linked. And not just top down, but also bottom up. For this, I'm writing every year to national parliaments to ask them on feedback on existing legislation that's coming up for revision. For that, we have established a close cooperation with the Committee of the Region and the Economic and Social Committee. We have started partnerships with regions, uh, more precisely with Bavaria and with Normandy. And we have also started to not only have seconded national experts, but also seconded regional 
experts because they also participate in this union. We have used the change of method in the Court of Auditors, which is now working on performance audits, to start a dialogue with the, with the Court of Auditors on which issues we, we would like to see performance audits to be undertaken. And our committee chair is asking for those legislative files which are up for revision. That means we allow for systematic input from the regional level, from the national level, to our members exactly when legislation is coming up for, uh, for revision. We've also set up a website called Gurbis. There was already another website called Orbis, so you see it's all a Catholic conspiracy. You know? <laughs> People always knew this. So we have a website which is called Orbis, which is assembling all expertise nationally or regionally available on the success or failure of our legislation. And there are many national or regional institutions who are doing a tremendous work on this. But we are assembling this all in one repository. For example, the French Court of Auditors is very strong, the German trade unions, the German employers' organization. All this expertise is being put together and then brought to the attention of the members once we are, uh, once we are adapting legislation. So we've been busy over the last 10 years. Where to go next? Uh, you can see in the lead candidates debate there is a new focus on legislative initiative. Of course, we need to take this with a little bit of care. Let's take the US Congress. The US Congress has the right of legislative initiative. But the truth is that 99% of the legislative initiatives never make it into law. <coughs> and the truth is also that when it comes to major legislation, it's nevertheless prefabricated in the administration if you're thinking, for example, of tax reform. <coughs> so we seem to be completely apart, but we are not, because at the same time, Parliament has found ways to impact on legislation, not only through joint programming, also through, and for the plan what I described, uh, also through our work on cost of non-Europe, because we can demonstrate that there's two trillion out there still to be activated in terms of growth, very difficult to resist. But we could go <coughs> further. We have the right of legislative own initiative reports, and I believe we could standardize this. We <coughs> could be more active, especially at the beginning of the legislature, and contribute more actively to the reflection that's happening in the first year of a new commission when they are trying to find out with, with which issues to push forward. I believe we can do more in linking effectively to the citizens. We've been doing a lot already. Our parliamentarian is not just in Brussels, but we are establishing what we call Experience Europe, which is similar to that, but smaller. In many of our member states, we have 100 in Lincoln, 150,000 visitors a year. We have just opened one in Finland with the new National Library, which has 40,000 visitors in one month, which is enormous for such a relatively small country. And step by step, we will enlarge this to all member states of the European Union. But also, digital is a game changer. In this election campaign, for the first time, we have offered to all citizens to directly link into us to receive material we have produced on all policy issues and even to receive training if they want so to be active in the campaign either through mailings or through special meetings. We have 300,000 European citizens who have registered with the European Parliament. 300,000 is enormous. Of course, we will not have 300,000 activists, but we believe we have 30,000 activists. 30,000 activists on the ground for Europe can make a big difference. It's very important to keep up this network. For this, we also need to change the way we are communicating. We need citizens-friendly language. We need to speak from the problems of the citizens. We have something out which we call the Leistungsgilan. So you see, the Germans are insisting. <laughs> First was 